What's going on, everybody? Welcome to this special episode of JJD TV. I'm your host, Josh, and today we are joined by a very special guest. He is a TSN analyst. He's a former TFC player for you MLS and Canadian fans out there. He's the assistant coach right now of the Canadian men's national team, and he's one of the very few players to be able to play for both Sunderland and Newcastle. I know, it's crazy. It's Stephen Cadwell, and we're going to be talking to him today and breaking down the hype that is the Canadians men's national team, their World Cup qualification hopes, talk a little bit about his career, his life, and of course, get his input on what is the European Super League. So hopefully you guys can sit back and enjoy it, and let's get into it now. All right, so Stephen, how are you doing today? Thanks so much again for coming on for the channel. Doing really well, Josh. Thanks for having me on. Excited to have a, a good chat with you today about football, soccer, whatever we want to call it. <laughs> yeah, this is, for those of you guys who don't know, this is the second time I've uh, tracked down Stephen and made him have coffee with me the one time. So it's good to see him again. I'm excited to have him here. And the conversation today is going to be mostly about the Canadian men's national team. As, uh, as Stephen, if, I don't know if you want to tell us quickly just your involvement and obviously your role with the, with the national team. Yeah, it's quite an interesting story, actually. I was I was calling Canadian men's national team games uh, a couple of years ago, and um, I think it was the previous Gold Cup, actually, in 2019, and um, got to know John Herman a little bit through that, and we had a couple of discussions coming out of that tournament, and he um, he asked me to, to come in and coach for the team as a guest coach, assistant coach for uh, the camp, starting off with the Nations League games against Cuba in September, and... Um, I went along, didn't know what to expect, you know, I thought it might have been a kind of one and done type thing, but we got on really well. I really enjoyed uh, working with John, learning from John, and uh, September turned into October, and of course that was our amazing uh, victory against the US at BMO Field, and it turned into November, and lo and behold, I've probably been in the last uh, six or seven camps, so, you know, I'm very much part-time, I'm an assistant coach uh, when John you know, sort of invites me and asks me, but it has been quite consistent and I've really enjoyed working with him and with the rest of the staff at Canada Soccer. It's such a high performance environment. It's a pleasure to be a part of it. And of course, we have some amazing players coming through at the moment just now. That, and that's fantastic. And as a lot of you guys probably know, some of you might not, but uh, Stephen actually got brought to Canada because he played for Toronto FC. So you can see in the background of, there we are, of mine and as well as Stephen's, he got the TFC uh, jerseys there. And Stephen, I just want to ask you, what, uh, what, led you to the decision to accept that offer and join Toronto FC? Uh, yeah, it was uh, a strange one, actually. It sort of came about really quickly at the end of my um, my season at Birmingham. I was leaving Birmingham City in the Championship in England, and I got an opportunity to, to come to Toronto. And in the beginning, um, it seemed like it was a bit rushed. They wanted me to come like, right away, and I'd been part of a kind of nine-month season in the UK. Um, so I wanted to wait till July, but after speaking to Ryan Nelson, the head coach at the time, um, he made it clear he needed me right away. And I just felt, I just felt the weight of the opportunity. I had a, a real good feeling of it, you know, jumping on a plane and coming to Toronto. And um, thankfully, my gut instinct was was certainly right. It was one of the best decisions I ever made. Uh, came to Toronto and the sort of eight week loan became a two and a half year contract and <laughs> played for a couple of years. Really enjoyed my time as a player. Unfortunately. TFC were getting me at the end of my career, so you know my my body was was breaking down a little bit. So I uh, retired and went to work with the the um, the organisation Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment. So I was a part of the TFC family all in all for probably five years. Uh, wonderful to be involved with such a great club and and, and a great company like MLSC and. Um, you know, I only wish everyone there all the success um, that they, they put into the, you know, they put a lot of hard work in, so they deserve the success that comes from it. And a uh, wonderful club, one of the best in MLS, in my opinion. Yeah, absolutely. And obviously uh, the, the country, the city, it took you on because you obviously up, uprooted your life and, and moved here. And what kind of decision was that like when you made the decision to, you know what, Canada's going to be my new home? Yeah, I mean, like I said, I was um, really feeling like the, the pull to come to Toronto. I felt like they needed someone in my um, attributes. You know, I was a leader. I was a guy who really, um, you know, helped bring together changing rooms and locker rooms and, and culture. So um, I sensed that TFC needed that at that time. Made the decision, came. Uh, it took me all of, I think, 20 minutes to realise that Toronto was a brilliant city and that I, it could be a home for me and my family. And um, when they eventually came over, my kids settled really well. And um, 
yeah, there was never really any thoughts to leave and, and go back home. Thankfully, the opportunities kept coming. And, um, you know, I'm still very grateful that I get to work in, in, in this tremendous country, this great city. And um, I have different different hats on at different times and, and do different things. But I love that <laughs> diversity. And um, I really enjoy being part of the, the growth of the game in Canada. Yeah, and the growth in the game definitely starts with, with our national team. And obviously... There's the limbo of uh, not being able to see your national team play for, I mean, well over a year. So how much does this current squad really impress you since seeing what, what it's like for them coming together after most of them never playing together and seeing the kind of performances they put on the pitch for the qualifiers? Yeah, I'm glad you actually started off like that, Josh, because while TFC have had some great success and, you know, Montreal have had a great Champions League campaign and Whitecaps have, have had some of their moments as well, some great players coming through there. The real true growth of the game will come through the success of the national team. You know, it really is something that, that binds a country together and has, you know, youngsters believing that they can be the next Alfonso Davies or Jonathan David or Jonathan Azorio or Derek Cornelius, you know. And, yeah. um, you know, that that's the kind of exciting thing about being part of Canadian soccer at the moment, that we, we have some tremendous talent coming through. Um, I've been so impressed with the, the mentality of this group the, uh, the, the quality that they have, the strength and depth, the sort of youngsters that are below the guys that have that shirt at the moment that are going to push them in the right way, in my opinion, and the brotherhood that they've built. And, um, you know, John Herman's played a large part in that, and I'm just privileged to, to have a role. But really, the way this, this group's came together and, and, and how it's, you know, more than just about the tactics or about what happens in the field, but building that brotherhood, the, the, the great staff that he's put together there that, that, that take an integral uh, role in that is critically important to the success that I feel we're going to achieve in the next few years. Yeah, absolutely. And after the two dominant performances you guys put on in the two opening World Cup qualifiers, what do you think was a key, putting your coaching hat on, what was a key uh, reason you think that the group just kind of mended together the way that they did and, and were able to put on that type of performance on the pitch? Um, I could say a sort of might sound like a little bit of a airy fairy word, but but destiny, <laughs> you know, like it's it's destiny. This group feel it. Timing, this is their time, you know, and 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 that's what allowed them to go and play at that level. Of course, we're playing against uh, inferior opposition. No disrespect to either of the teams. Uh, Barbados, eh, sorry, Bermuda were hard, uh, hampered by the fact that some of their, their, their European players couldn't come over, but. Um, we took care of it in the right manner because we really believe this is our time, that we are in a position to, to do something truly unique in this country, qualify for a World Cup. We were at 86 and, you know, that was amazing, but this is our time. We want to qualify. We don't just want to get there. We want to go and show people on the world stage what we're all about. So, you know, everything I've said there is just words. It's about actions now. And it's about everyone playing their part and pulling together to to make that dream a reality. And I, I think that this is a time destiny is on our side and we're, we're meant to achieve this and we're going to go out there and prove it every time we get a chance. And we certainly did that in the two games in March. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm, I've been lucky enough to cover the the national team a little bit on, on our channel. And I wasn't sure exactly what to expect uh, when, when doing it because it wasn't my typical type of content. And it was overwhelming the amount of people that were just so positive and so upbeat about what was happening here. So there has been a lot of hype around this national team. I just wanted to get your opinion on how do you think this young group is going to be able to deal with the pressure down the line when these need to win games kind of come about? Yeah, it's, it's about growing, isn't it? It's about going through experiences and, and, and sticking together as a group. You know, you, you, you hear me say the same things quite a lot because I, I truly believe in them. I truly believe in that team spirit, that culture, uh, whatever you want to call it, brotherhood, you know, about, about being one, you know, and, and, and having that one vision, that one direction, that one goal. And um, and there will be tough times because we are young and we're still learning and we've had our bumps in the road. But if we learn from the bumps and we, we, we stay as a group, will eventually become better for them, you know, and we've we'll found that in, in some of the, the um, you know, the sort of the, the difficulties that we've had in the last few years. So um, I think this group's ready. I do, I, I really believe that the talent's there and the, um, the determination's there to go and prove to everybody how good they can be. And um, like I said, they're, um, they're, a, they're a great group to coach. They're really... Um, 
humble guys. They're guys that um, understand the joy that they can bring to everyone in the soccer community and in their country. And I think that's um, that's a great um, great mindset to be in when you're trying to achieve something that's that's not been done for a number of years. Yeah, absolutely. And looking back at one of the famous, most famous victories. I mean, you you were a part of it. You know, I was going to ask it. Uh, it was one. It was a game that really got my attention. It really kind of drew me. I mean, I'm a huge football fan. I I've followed the team, but watching them take on the states and, and beat them in that game was something special. And I just wanted to hear just a little bit of your thoughts when, because you were obviously a part of that win. Yeah, to me, it was more than just a victory. It was the manner of the victory, and it was the way that we we went about that, and how positive we were as a group, and how we wanted to impose ourselves on. A U.S. national team that we, we hadn't beaten for gosh knows how long. Can't remember twenty some years, thirty some years actually. It might be thirty four years. Um, so, you know, that's what's important because that's what creates that confidence and that mindset and allows us to then, you know, a year or so later go and beat a team a record victory eleven nil because we're just so <laughs> ruthless that we never want to yeah. stop at three or four or five. We want to just keep going and keep going to the point where we want to prove to everybody how big a stride that we're making as a nation. So, um, yeah, I, I love that. That whole uh, camp was amazing. The preparation, what I learned from it, how you, um, you can inspire people and how you can bring everybody together with that one vision and then to go and like execute the plan for the players to do that the way that they did was really special. It was one of the, I don't know, top top three, top five nights of my career. And um, you know, <laughs> never think that you can even get close to some of the things I've been lucky enough to achieve in terms of playing, uh, you know, winning at Wembley and lifting trophies and winning league league titles in the championship. But it's up there because it was really special and to share it with people that have now become my friends and, and my brothers was was something unique. No, that's that's amazing, and, and it's taken a shine to this country. It absolutely has, and especially for me, for example, is I'm starting to really keep an eye on these Canadian men's national team players abroad, and it's it's very interesting seeing them play in Portugal and Turkey and Saudi Arabia, all over the world where these players are playing. So I'm just kind of curious, just for a coaching aspect, do you have any role in kind of keeping an eye on these players and tracking them and seeing how they're progressing? And if so, if you could elaborate a little bit. Yeah, I, I certainly do. I'm, I'm, you know, like I said, I'm a bit of part-time coach, but I'm always there for John. I, I can't switch off for this kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, it's always in the forefront of my mind. I'm, I'm, I'm checking up. I'm, I'm more in a defensive unit, so, you know, I focus on the defenders and I make sure that that everyone's feeling good and, and check up on how their games have went and, you know, good or bad, like send a little message and, and allow these guys to know that I'm watching and that I'm there for them. Um, and then I support John in every way that, that he needs me pre-camp, during camp, and then uh, you know a little bit of debrief after camp. So um, I feel very invest invested. I would be sort of regardless because uh, when I get into something, I you know I don't really do it by half. I, I'm, I'm really full in. But I have my other responsibilities as well out with the Canadian men's national team, and I'm I'm, I'm very much aware that. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not a staff member of Canada Soccer, but yeah, what can you say? Like the, the success that we've had as a group is just um, inspiring and it's infectious. And um, I think what's unique about this is that it's, you mentioned some of the European guys and they certainly grabbed the headlines, but this is about one group and there's a lot of success going on here in North America as well. And the success that happens here in North America, in our Canadian teams, some guys playing in, in, in US teams in MLS, is also a breeding ground for the future and for uh, the stepping stones that they may or may not take to go to Europe or to progress within MLS or to win more caps, to become a regular in the Red of Canada. Um, it's really important to recognise that as well. And I think the guys like Mark Anthony Kay, Max Capo's development in, in Vancouver, um, Jonathan Azorio, the battles that he's had at Toronto to become such an important established member of that team. Uh, I'm going to, I should never have started this. I'm going to miss people out. Alistair Johnson in Nashville, uh, Dane Sinclair in Minnesota. These guys are playing an important role as well as the Carl Larins and the Atiba Hutchinsons and the Stefan Astakios and the Jonathan Davids and Alfonso Davies in Europe. Yep. 
Absolutely. It's got to start somewhere. And you've seen it with the, the States over the years and you're starting to see it with Canada that these MLS, play, MLS players are mixing in with the players in Europe. And Richie Larea, in my opinion, had a, had a fantastic appearance when uh, he played in the qualifiers. I thought he looked really good on that right-hand side. And, and yeah, it, it starts there. But I guess my next question would be when you take on that step and as you talked about making that step potentially from the MLS to a European league, we've seen a lot of success in the, the United States players going over to the Bundesliga. And I was just wanted to pick your ear because, I mean, the Bundesliga is what we cover a lot here on a... Uh, on the channel, I was wondering if uh, you have any input on young younger Canadians making that leap over to the Bundesliga and if that should be a league they should look at. Yeah, I think it should be. And I think it's not just about young Canadians or, or, or young Americans, US players. I think that, as we've seen even in England, uh, it's a destination for any young player. Why? Because you get an opportunity. You get a chance to learn and grow and yeah. become the the confident player that we've seen so many people uh you know go to the Bundesliga become so terrific league uh league I really got to know at the start of the pandemic of course because it was a first back and I really enjoyed watching it it's um good football it's fast a lot of counter attacks um some really top players playing within the Bundesliga so um, my advice would certainly be to look at Bundesliga teams when you're thinking about a destination if you're leaving leaving Canada uh, to, to go and play or North America to go and play. Um, and again, it just the structure, I think, of Bundesliga teams is, is really interesting and quite similar, I guess, to North America with a sporting director or a general manager, or whatever you want to call it. It's that kind of like front office type thing with a head coach and... And, and, and real kind of detail around the structure of the club, which we're starting to see more and more in, in the UK and more and more in other parts of Europe because it works and it allows everyone to focus on their responsibilities. And then it allows the players to be the best version of themselves. And usually when you have that structure, your recruitment's spot on as well. So you know what you're getting when the player comes and then you can help him to succeed when he uh, eventually gets in the first team. Yeah, and obviously making that connection to the uh, the Canadian that's over there right now, making headlines and winning a Champions League. I mean, how how special it is to work with this this kid because he's so good. And and watching him play for the Canadian national team, you you, you know why he's he's already a Champions League winner and why he's gonna have a glorious career. So I just want to get your opinion on what it's like seeing him with the boys and if he's has some type of leadership role even at a young age. Well, he um, he's a guy that loves life. He's a guy that, that, that loves being with his mates. I see him come back and. <laughs> It's pretty cool, actually, because you win, what did he win, five, six trophies in a year and you know, <laughs> winning a game, Champions League and Club World Cup and Bundesliga. And you, you just wonder, you know, what he's going to be like. And I know he's only, a, a, you know, is he 20, 21? I forget. His name. <laughs> you wonder what he's going to be like. And then you just see him come in and he's the same lad who likes to joke and like I said loves being with his buddies and and, and really feels at home just um, relaxing and playing football and and being the guy that is and I, I think that's absolutely remarkable and I, I hope he keeps that for as long as he can and everybody matures and everybody grows up but at the moment he's just loving life and so um, that to me is the most special thing about Alfonso um, he loves his football his athleticism is like nothing that I've ever seen <laughs> It's on another level. It's just quite incredible. And and his maturity in terms of the way that he plays the game and his positional sense and his decision-making is improving exponentially every single camp and every single time that, that, that I get to spend time with him. So it's uh, it's quite remarkable. Um, scary to think the age he's at, where he, where he you know, get to because he's improving. And long may it continue, because I do think that this lad is going to be in such a strong space when he's 26, 27, that um, it can only be good for, for the national team. Yeah, absolutely. He's uh, someone who's already won pretty much everything there was to win at his young age. And yeah. I mean, for the, our national team, it's just it's so incredible seeing someone with his talent coming in. And yeah, it's so here, good to hear you say all those things about him. But Stephen, there's one final question that I want to ask you, and it wasn't a part of the original questions that we're doing, but with the breaking news that's, that's happened about the European Super League, and I mean, the fact that we have a former professional here on the channel, I need to get your opinion. And if you want to just, however you want to say it, just give me your thoughts and opinions on the, the European Super League, and if it's a good or bad idea, and just really go at it. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely terrible for the game of football that we all know. Uh, you know, I don't think I'm unique in giving that opinion unanimously I've, I've heard that and um, 
I completely agree with everything that, that I hear. It's, it's, it's going to be the death of football, especially back home uh, in Europe, in the UK, where we have a pyramid system. We love the game because we dream and we believe that you can drop, unfortunately, drop as low as you can and you can rise as high as you can. You can win a Premier League when you're Leicester and you can be in the League One only when I was playing 15, 20 years ago when you're Manchester City and anything could change, anything could turn around. And quite ironic that they're one of the teams now that are obviously part of the six that are going to break away. It's disgusting. It's about money. It's greed. It's creating a monopoly. All the things that I despise as a, a human being and as a lover of uh, uh, football. So um, I hope that everybody rallies against us. Uh, I appreciate you giving me a platform to say something about it and any time that I can speak up, I will do so with complete honesty and I'll, I, I encourage everyone else to do the same thing because the power of football is in the people. We just mentioned that. We talked all about culture there and about groups and being one and brotherhood and there's an unwritten brotherhood in football even amongst the tribalism and the support that we have for our individual teams. We love this game so passionately that we want to try and protect the reasons that we love it. And the reasons that we love it is everything that I've just mentioned. It's not about money. It's not about AC Milan playing Manchester United or Barcelona playing against Manchester City. It's about anybody on their day can figure out another team and win a game of football. And if we allow this to happen, we'll take that away from, uh, from the future of the game. So uh, everybody speak up, get together. Let's show these people that they can't win, that they can't take our game away from us. And uh, I don't think it'll happen because I think the power of the people will be far too strong. Yeah, you never know how dangerous social media is until you, you make that wrong post. <laughs> and yeah, and, yeah. yeah we, went, we went live yesterday with a lot of different people from a lot of different clubs, every single one coming together and saying hashtag save our sport. And awesome. hearing your words today, Stephen, were absolutely fantastic, right along with pretty much everything you've been hearing. And if you're not if you're not for it, it's because you just you like the greed, you like the money. So, yeah. Stephen, honestly, this was a fantastic conversation. I appreciate you coming on the channel so much, talking a little bit of the Canadian men's national team, and also giving your opinion on the European Super League. So, but from the bottom of my heart, I really appreciate it, and hopefully, we'll uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Josh. See you soon. Take care.